Uh, I invite you to open in your Bibles to Jonah 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 16, and then a little while later we'll be reading Mark 4. We're, of course, starting our new series on the book of Jonah. Uh, There's a schedule, which is a bookmark. You're invited to take uh, in the entrances to the sanctuary. We'll be in Jonah for four weeks. There's four chapters. (coughs) Jonah 1, beginning at verse 1, this is God's holy word. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord." But the Lord Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. When the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and, what, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, that the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, may you speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word, and may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. In the mid-19th century, A child was born to a wealthy, religious, devout Catholic family in England. And his parents sent their child, once grown, to a medical school to follow in his father's footsteps. But after he had failed his medical exam three times, he fled to London to become a writer. Eventually, he had found himself living on the streets, uh, addicted to drugs and opium, until Eventually, his health had decreased to the point that a prostitute had actually found him on the streets, and feeling pity for him, she nursed him back to health, where he briefly began to write, but then suddenly died because of illness due to all of his years of self-abuse. Christian writers such as G.K. 
Chesterton and J.R. Uh, Tolkien, they revered this man's poetry. One poem entitled The Hound of Heaven is a confession of his life running from the Lord. It reads, I fled him, that is God, down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine in ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter, he stated, while writing this poem, I fled him, but everywhere I fled him, he hounded me. This, of course, if you're familiar with that poem, is the writing of Francis Thompson. But it's also the story of the prophet Jonah. Flee God in your heart, and you'll find yourself in the midst of a storm. Today, as we look at this passage, uh, you'll see, actually throughout the series, you'll see God's mercy, but today we'll see God's mercy in spite of our sin and maybe even a surprising twist. Uh, I have the outline in your sermon notes. Uh, we'll look at today the prophet's disobedience, the pagan's obedience, and then finally, we'll look at the gospel according to Jonah. First, the prophet's disobedience. Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel during the 8th century, uh, during the reign of, of King Jeroboam II. Uh, Jonah was known for his support of this king strong, uh, the strong military expansion, the show of military force of Jeroboam II. He would have been, by all accounts, a ancient nationalist. Nineveh, was Israel's enemy, was the capital of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, which was the powerhouse empire to the east of Israel, known for their cruelty. And it's in this setting, the word of the Lord comes to this Israelite prophet to go into this Gentile city, one that was hostile to his people and their God, to minister to them there. And I cannot oversell the violence and the evil of the Assyrian Empire at this time, nor fully describe to you it from the pulpit due to its indecency. They tortured and dismembered their enemies. They left cities destroyed and covered in dead bodies. Soldiers would even cut off the, the legs and one arm of their enemies so that they could laughingly shake their hand as they died. They removed body parts from their living victims. They coerced the families to desecrate their loved ones' bodies. Imagine Jonah's disgust when the word of the Lord calls him to go minister to these people. Do you think this was the call of God that Jonah was excited to have come into his life. For Jonah to go to Nineveh, he would have to travel briefly north and then east. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down south to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish west. He physically goes in the contrary direction to God's command to flee the presence of the Lord as if you could flee his presence. Jeremiah says, I am a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away. Can man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 23, Jonah, of course, pays the fare boards a ship, and away he goes. Notice the word play. God called Jonah to go to a, verse 2, great city. But instead, verse 4, God will send Jonah a great wind to produce a mighty storm. And in Hebrew, it's the same word for great. See, regardless of Jonah, God is going to greatly display his grace 
and mercy. What are some takeaways from this already? First, just because we struggle with God's call in our lives and what his word tells us, it doesn't mean there's no good reason for it. When Jonah was confronted with God's word, right, he couldn't see any good reason for this command, so he concluded there couldn't be. Have you ever been confronted with the truth of God's word but decided your way was preferable? Is God calling you to live in a way or to do something that you would rather not do? Are you refusing to yield to him because you want your way? Secondly, God allows storms in our lives to correct us. Uh, Tim Keller wrote, every act of disobedience to God has a storm attached to it. Tarshish, Jonah's preferred destination, not God's. It comes to represent our rebellious self-will. The Lord wants me to go here, but I'll do it my way is the path to Tarshish. God's storms have a way of turning us from Tarshish. Friends, not every hardship is the result of sin, but every hardship will put to death our sin. Romans 5 says that these storms have a way of producing in us endurance, patience, character, and hope, that they strengthen our faith, that they make us stronger, more humble, more Christ-like people. Uh, an older, wiser friend once told me the process of sanctification, that it's becoming more like Jesus, that process is mostly painful. She said to me, what pleasure is it to die to your self-will? What feels good about being in the valley, the furnace, the storm? And yet many of the most faithful were formed by hardship. I remember an interview with B.B. King who talked about growing up in Mississippi, and he lamented working in the cotton fields but then said he would not have traded that experience for anything in the world. Why? It's in these hardships that we experience God's grace and his mercy anew in our hearts and in our circumstances. Are you in the eye of a storm right now? Are you living in disobedience, knowing God's word or his call for your life, but you would rather be in Tarshish. The irony of Jonah running is that whenever you run from God, you'll run directly into God. Be sure, number says, your sin will find you out. God loves you too much to leave you in Tarshish, to leave you as you are but he has a greater plan for his people. Second, the pagan's obedience in contrast to the prophet's disobedience, the pagan's obedience. You know, it's really remarkable if you stop and, and think about Jonah chapter one. The integrity of these sailors is being contrasted with this prodigal prophet Jonah. In many ways, here's several, one, Think about this. Jonah was sleeping and inactive in the storm. The sailors were alert and, and working diligently to keep the ship from breaking up. Two, the pagans were praying. The pagans were praying while God's prophet was silent. The pagan captive even rebukes the prophet. Verse 6, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. What a disgrace for a man of God. The pagans were somehow spiritually astute to conclude that this storm was because of someone's sin. Uh, when the captain woke Jonah, he says, Arise, call. And these are the exact Hebrew words God used to call Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh. 
to call them to repentance. Do you see the rich irony that the chapter one is showing us here? Jonah rejected God's call to point the Gentiles to God to repent. But instead, the Gentiles are now pointing Jonah to God to repent. The pagan sailors, they cast lots, which was an ancient practice to seek divine counsel. And when it lands on Jonah, the pagans still graciously ask him. They're inquiring if this is correct. Verse 8, they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? And after Jonah even indicates the only solution here is that they must throw him overboard, these pagan sailors try every conceivable way to satiate the Lord without killing his prophet. As one author says, quote, at every point they outshine Jonah. They rebuke Jonah for his disobedience to the Lord. Verse 10, what is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And then the pagans turn to the Lord in prayer, just as Jonah should have done. Therefore, verse 14, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, and they're using his covenantal name here, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. They use God's personal covenantal name in the Hebrew, Yahweh, in their prayer, signifying that something has happened. There's a personal relationship with God as they cry out for his salvation, the same as a sinner crying out the personal name of Jesus for salvation today. How do we know that these sailors, these pagans, came to know the Lord for salvation? One of the major themes in this chapter is the theme of fear. The book of Jonah uses this word fear to describe the sailors. But Jonah also claims, verse 9, I am a Hebrew, I fear the Lord, the God who made the sea, which is storming, and the dry land. The Hebrew word for Fear communicates either a sense of terror of your circumstance or, or fear of man, or it could indicate a fear that is all in worship of God. It depends on the context. The pagan sailors were in fearful terror during the storm, but it transforms at the end of this passage into fearful Worship. They have come to fear God. And they are exceedingly more fearful after the storm is calmed using the same Hebrew word. These men, verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They turn, which is the story of all of us, right? They turn from the fear of their circumstance to a reverent fear, faith, worship of God. One commentator says this, Jonah's claim to fear the Lord was shallow and hollow. Their fear of the Lord is deep and real. There are two kinds of fears in the Bible. We all will live life with our fears directed at man or our circumstance, or we will fear God. Proverb tells us that the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. What we fear, we worship. Whatever you fear, you worship. Meaning that we orient our lives around our fears. A fear of God leads to obedience and a deep comfort amid life's storms. You know, could you imagine being tossed around on this ship 
You know, hearing like the timbers beginning to, to crack and the stress of the pounding on the hall. Fear the Lord, Proverbs says, and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your bones, the Proverbs tells us. You see, when these men had their fears turned to the Lord, right, they see his power. They see that he is more powerful than this storm. They are led to fearful worship of him, offering him sacrifices. And brothers and sisters, these sailors, once pagan, they offer us an example. They confess their helplessness. They hear God's witness through his prophet. And they begin to move that fear to the one true God. Brothers and sisters, what is it that you fear? Having enough money? A relationship? Being loved? Feeling fulfilled? Your family's well-being? Your reputation in the community at work? Career? Being in control? Do you fear illness? Do you feel inadequate? Do you fear loss? The fear of God works to drive out all of your worries, all of these false fears, these false hopes. Perfect love cast out all fear. God often uses these storms to show us what we really fear to reveal that he is greater than any of these difficult circumstances. All storms are subject to the Lord. And friends, the Christian life, I'm convinced, is a gradual progression of learning to fear God and not our storms. Gradually, he cast out those fears, although this process is so painful. Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand, the Lord promises us. And this leads to my last point, the gospel according to Jonah. In Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35, Mark tells us this. On that day when evening had come, Jesus, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Jesus, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you notice any similarities? Both Jesus and Jonah were on boats overtaken by storms with almost identical descriptions. They were both sleeping, awoken to be told we're going to die, both ships were saved by a divine miracle, calming the storm. And in both events, the sailors became more fearful after the miracle than during the storm. Jonah had a choice to confess and die for the sailors 
or allow them to suffer the same fate. Uh, one scholar, James Bruckner, said, the irony of Jonah's decision is that he will die in either case. God has reduced his decision to the question, will your life and death save the lives of others? Jonah offers himself as a sacrifice, becoming a scapegoat for these sailors. Brothers and sisters, isn't that the gospel? Jesus had a choice to become a scapegoat, that all his life and his death to save the lives of others or to allow us to perish in the storm brought on by our sin. Jesus, there's another similarity, he did throw himself into that great storm, just not on that day. He threw himself into the ultimate storm, the great storm on the cross. He was the ultimate scapegoat, what Paul says, the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sin, the worst storm. He was the sign of, of Jonah. Do you remember in Matthew, Jesus says, for just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12. You see, only Jesus drowned in the storm that could ever bring his people true harm, the storm of God's judgment. These sailors awoke Jesus and asked him if, they, if he cared that they were about to perish. They have no idea how wrong that question was. They believed that Jesus really loved them then they would not be experiencing this storm. But how does Jesus respond? Why are you so afraid? What, have you still no faith? Friends, have we ever questioned God's love for us and presence with us because of our hardships? Jesus is asking us today, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? He says to you today, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Isaiah 43. You see, Jesus, because he loves us, he allows his people to go through the storms, but they cannot ultimately harm you. They'll be for your own good and for his glory. All things work together to accomplish his wise and loving plan for you. Not some things, not only things that feel good, but all things. And if Jesus won't allow you to experience the great storm, why would he abandon you now? We've never been in the storm that he threw himself in. No greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. He has shown us by infinite cost to himself that he cares about us, about you. What is your suffering now? Is it financial? Is it marital? Is it health? Are you lonely? Are you discontent? Are you hurt? Have you been betrayed? Are you angry? Are you envious? These hurt deeply, but God will never leave nor forsake you. And he will endure with you till the end. He's calmed your greatest storm. Brothers and sisters, I'll end on this. He promises you this day his presence. He says to you, through the words of David, Where shall I go from your spirit? 
Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. And if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, but the night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Psalm 139, brothers and sisters, this is our hope. He's with us in our storms. Have faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we cannot imagine the cost to yourself. Uh, that you have paid. We think about our confession of faith that you have become truly human. You have become man in every way we are yet without sin. In order that you could pay this cost, that you could incur this penalty, that you could possibly even throw yourself into the storm. And that because of this, you have calmed the storm of God's judgment over us. May we be people that have no guilt in life, no fear in death, to know that you are always with us, that you love us, that you love our loved ones more than we even can, and that we can trust you in good times and in bad, knowing that you will work all things for our good and your glory. Put to death our faithlessness. Liven faith in us, we pray. Amen.